During that period of time, I've caught some pretty big fish, and I'm going to demonstrate some of the techniques that I've adopted uh, over that period of time to catch some of the better ones. This is one of two complementing videos I have produced on pike fishing, and deals mainly with tackle and techniques, whilst its counterpart concentrates more on winter and summer pike fishing and catching the fish themselves. Later in the program, the I'll be giving an in-depth demonstration now, of my techniques concerning tackle, bait and casting. I'll and also be chatting to one of the country's round leading round experts round on pike and pike fishing, uh, Fred Buller. Really but first, let's look at the fish itself and find out something about this magnificent creature. The pike has become one of the most efficient underwater predators of all time and relies on its excellent eyesight speed and a series of organs which make up the neuromast system. These are responsible for detecting the range, bearing and movement of its prey and are exquisitely sensitive to water being displaced around its body. Looking at the pike in the water, notice the pectoral and dorsal fins moving delicately so as not to disturb its own neuromast system. And the eye stands little chance against the hand of the pike. When you see it, the pike grabs and swallows the fish tail first. To learn more about the pike and its behaviour, I took a trip to the beautiful Buckinghamshire countryside in order to visit one of the country's leading experts on pike and pike fishing, Fred Buller. Fred is the author but, uh, of several definitive books on the subject, which have received worldwide yeah. acclaim. Yes. He invited me into yes, his I mean, study, which was a gold mine of information trailing, and intrigue. They, they I began round round by asking round, him why the pike has become such a successful predator, predator um, over, over such, such a long, long period, period of time. time. I think that, that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of them being in a, in a niche. And they having have they have developed the equipment which perfectly suits this particular niche. Yes. Uh, having a big mouth is a good thing. Yes. Having a big having big teeth is a good thing. Yes. Um, <coughs> uh, being built uh, in a way that makes them very fast swimmers over a very short distance, obviously, is is a tremendous help to a predator. Yes. But why I'm interested in the niche aspect, um, uh, Hugh Forkus uh, uh, told me that uh, they occasionally get pike in, in his river, in, in the, the, the Cumbrian-esque. Yes. And these are fish that have escaped from a lake tarn way up in the mountains, uh, where they flourish uh, on a diet of perch and sticklebacks. Occasionally they get into the river. When he spots one in a particular location, in a particular pool, and marks it down, he has found that the next time he spots it, it's usually three or four or five pools lower down. Yeah. And over that season, after first being spotted, it gets lower and lower, and then it disappears. Yeah. So it eventually gets washed out to sea. You see, it doesn't fit into that niche. It can't flourish where, there is, where you've got mountain torrents, yeah. uh, very fast water. But in, in the niche that it has found for itself, yeah. it's perfect. And the evidence of it lasting so long is the evidence itself. Fred, if anybody asked you how big pike actually do grow in this country, what upper limit weight-wise would you put on pike? Well, I think historically, um, possibly, uh, I'm fairly sure in my own mind that the the, the, 18, uh, the 1860 something pike caught on Loch Derg is genuine, uh, because I've looked at the uh, I've looked at the newspaper cuttings, I've looked, uh, I've read the accounts of the witnesses, and most importantly, the size given, the length given for that fish ties in perfectly yeah. 
with with the material that we have, the data that we have, which predicts the yeah. the length, the weight of a pipe from its length mm. and girth. Mm. And they didn't have that information. So I think exceptionally, a pipe could grow up to a weight of 90 pound. But of course, having regard to the funny things that they've been doing to rainbow trout, who knows what they can do to pike? Yes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's, that's something that I'm not particularly interested in. Uh, I'm, I'm only interested in wild fish. And uh, I think there's plenty of evidence uh, for, for fish of 60 and 70, and I dare say exceptionally, uh, a pike could grow to a weight of 90. Yes. But I think they're much, much less likely to in this day and age because that obtained in the old days has gone. Uh, uh, when there were much larger runs of, uh, of uh, sea trout and salmon which were bringing extra riches from the sea yes. into the lakes, um, if, you, if, you, if you take out their, the contribution they made, mm. then you have to look at what's left and that's a, a, a poorer situation altogether. Well, I know back in the 60s you were, you were fishing Loch Lomond with Richard Walker and Peter Thomas and uh, Hugh Farkas. Um, do, you, do you think there, there are still very big fish in, in Lomond? Because I know the situation there has changed somewhat over the, the last 10 or 15 years. Well, I think so. So long as runs of sea trout and salmon uh, carry on, uh, and who knows? I mean, we may, we may find ways and means of uh, improving those runs. And when that happens, yeah. then the potential will certainly come back. But I couldn't, I couldn't uh, rule out the possibility, even with the with the smaller runs of salmon and sea trout, that uh, exceptionally, a uh, pike may still grow to a weight of. 50, 60 pounds in, 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 in Loch Lomond. I wouldn't be, to answer your question, I wouldn't si be surprised if tomorrow there was a headline, 55, 65 pound pike caught in Loch Lomond. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Modern day anglers use a, an incredible range of methods to, to catch pike. What would you say is the most successful method of, of catching big pike, Fred? Well, uh, I think if I, if I were fishing for a big pipe because I knew that it was in a certain location, I would fish with a dead bait. I mean, I was totally converted to dead baiting uh, when I became associated with certain of my friends. Yes. Um, um, prior to that, I was a, used to spin and uh, live bait. I don't live bait anymore because I have found that uh, the dead baits answer the purpose. And of course, having witnessed what can be done with dead baits, I sought to reason why this was the case. And a simple, a very simple piece of arithmetic uh, tells me. For instance, if you take the, the fish, the main dietary item of the Loch Lomond pike, pound, or used to be the the main dietary item, those fish range from one year to ten, and yet it's very difficult to find power and over five years old. So yes. obviously vast numbers of these fish die if they don't become sick. Them up, well, pike and possibly eels. So there is a, there is a crop of dead and dying fish which are available to pike every year in a situation like that and in every situation yes. so I think I think that uh, well the answer to your question is that my, my method would be dead baiting uh, and uh, but for sheer pleasure I find that fishing with a plug especially a surface plug and see a pike take a, a, a bait off the top really is very, very exciting. exciting.
Yes. That's the way I, I mostly fish because I'm lucky enough to be able to fish places where pike can be taken that way. Then that, with that method. Yeah. Yes. But that's quite a different answer to, to, to the, your question. To the, to the, your, the real answer to your question is dead bait. Dead bait, yes. Mm, every time. And have you any preference for dead bait? Yes. Um, I think that my, from my own experience, uh, my, my, uh, most of the places that I fish where there is a prospect of catching a very big pike, um, the, m the main dietary item or the favoured dietary item is a member of the salmonid, a trout or a yes. sea trout. Yes. So therefore, I would, if, uh, I would always use a dead trout in preference to anything else. I was talking to Pete Stone not, uh, not so long ago, and uh, he told me the sequel um, to your lost pike, and I was absolutely fascinated in this. Could, could you tell us that story, Fred? Because uh, I know many modern-day anglers would love to hear the, the full story. Yes, well, as I have already admitted, the loss of that fish, my friends have tried to cover up for me, and it was entirely down to me, just plain stupidity. It was on, it was witnessed, uh, it, was a, it was a very, very big pike. Um, and there it was. Dick said, we'll, we'll get it, don't worry, we'll get it, we'll come back. And, uh, and so he went off and we, he and I came back a month later, because there were four of us originally. Yes. But Dick and I went back a month afterwards and uh, he was very confident. I wasn't. Uh, we didn't catch. We didn't catch anything of note on the second trip, but we had lots of fun talking to each other, as you can imagine. Yes. Um, but the extraordinary thing about it was that uh, uh, my friend uh, Brian Clark, who's, who was the Sunday Times angling correspondent, wrote about it uh, in the Sunday Times and, and he got an extraordinary letter. I mean, this happened in 1967, and uh, this person wrote to Brian saying that he had, he'd been walking his dog with his son on the Endrick Bank uh, at the same time, time. Uh, within a week of my losing the fish. the fish. And he had found a dead pike, washed up, a huge fish, he said. And it was being, it had, had been attacked by crows and various things, he said, but it was huge. Uh, and um, Brian Clark was kind enough to send this letter to me, yeah. and I corresponded with, with uh, the gentleman. And he said that uh, this pike had a wire trace uh, coming out of the pike's mouth, and the treble hook was in the throat and it was attached to the top and to the bottom and had in fact choked the fish and that was the reason for it being dead. Yes. And of course Richard Walker put a, a weight of 45 or 50 pounds almost on that, that, that fish, Fred. Um, yes, yes, yes. He said it's by far the biggest uh, freshwater fish he'd ever seen in his life. And uh, there it is. But. Uh, it was a nightmare. It no longer is a nightmare. My, my, my dear friend Hugh put me at rest, put my mind at rest. He said, he said it would probably have spoiled you if you'd caught it. And uh, he said, where is it? <laughs> because you've lost it, he said, it doesn't matter, really. He said, uh, your friends know that, uh, that you put yourself in front of the pike because you worked it out. That was a very good thing. The fact that you lost it was too bad. And uh, he was absolutely right, and I've, I've not worried about it since. Yeah. I've chosen this rather lovely spot, which is just outside of Oxford, to uh, come and show you some of the dead bait rigs uh, I use for pike. Um, and the first rig, um, is probably the most effective dead bait rig um, I've used over the past 10 or 12 years. Um, and I use it particularly in gravel pits. The rig itself consists of two number eight 
trebles. Um, the first treble here is fixed and as you can see it doesn't slide up and down the trace. The bottom treble is fixed uh, by the way of a crimp or a crimping sleeve and the trace itself it is 28 pound um, seven strand trace wire, stainless steel trace wire um, and this trace is about 20 to 24 inches in length. Attached to the end of the trace we've got a swivel um, and one of the best swivels is a, is a Berkeley. This is a Berkeley swivel from America um, and that's attached at the end of the, uh, the trace wire by the way of a, a crimping sleeve again. Now the rig itself consists of a plastic bait supporting link. Now what this link is going to do, it is going to support my bait while I cast the bait out. The link, attached to the link, we've got um, an oval split ring. And the oval split ring is going to be attached to the bottom of the swivel. And all as we do is that we place the, sp the split ring onto the swivel and the link So that's, that's the essence of the rig. Now, looking at the rig very closely, we've got a flat ridge here, across here, and a loop of line is going to sit on that flat ridge. The loop of line is going to go down to the root of the tail of the mackerel, because I'm going to use a mackerel in a moment, I'm going to show you how the mackerel is cast. So the loop of line comes from this flat ridge down to the the root of the mackerel's tail and the loop of line is going to be shorter than the length of the trace. The hooks are going to be pinned into the bait very loosely and the bait can then be cast out with ease. Now when the bait hits the water the loop of line will fall off this flat ridge and the hooks will be very lightly pinned into the bait. So I think without further ado I'm going to attach the trace um, to the main line and I'm going to set up a bait for you and I'm going to show you how the rig actually works. So what we've got is that we've got a length of main line here attached to a rod and it's quite a heavy rod in fact, this rod's a, a four pound test curve rod and it's used for out and out dead bait fishing. I'm going to put a knot in the 15 pound main line. I'm going to wet that knot and I'm going to slide that knot down very gently, giving it a nice hard tug or strong tug at the end. snip the line off and there is the dead bait rig actually attached to the main line. The hooks you'll notice are barbed. Um, lots of pike anglers today debarb their hooks, they either crush them with forceps or pliers. I choose to use barbed hooks. This is an instant strike dead bait rig. As soon as a pike picks up this bait from the bottom of the gravel pit in front of me, I'm immediately going to pick the rod up and I'm going to strike. Now I've used debarbed hooks, I've used barbless hooks and semi-barbless hooks um, and I've lost pike on them. I've also used semi-barbless hooks and I've managed to get pike in but I'm much happier using a hook with small barbs um, rather than using a hook without any barbs at all. Um, the hook, we mustn't forget, is going to be struck into the pike's mouth. The pike itself isn't going to be deeply hooked and the barb, to my way of thinking, is the safe link between me and the pike. Um, it's very difficult, sometimes it's virtually impossible, 
to keep a tight line on a pike and of course if the uh, the hooks are, are debarbed the pike may jump out of the water may come back on itself and of course you've lost that fish which you've waited six or seven hours for so I use barb hooks and that, that's my own personal preference but this treble we mustn't forget is, a, is attached, firmly attached to the wire. A lot of people in the past have had this hook riding up and down the trace, they slip the hook up and down the trace and when they strike this hook moves, they don't get a, a, a decent hook hold on the pike and subsequently they've, they've lost the fish. So I prefer to have this hook well and truly uh, and firmly attached to the wire. Now, how I do that, just before I, I, I mount the mackerel and show you how it's used, is that before this hook, this treble, the bottom treble is attached, I get the wire and I come back through the eye, I go through the centre of the treble hook, I come through the eye, I wrap the wire three times around the shank, I poke it through in the little hole at the bottom which I leave and I just pull it up tight. That hook then cannot move and when I strike I've got a good solid resistance to actually hook the pike. So that's very important but there again that is only my personal preference. Um, I know a lot of you um, like to use hooks which you can slide up and down which accommodate different size baits. I prefer to make up traces according to the size bait I use but always have this attached. So let's get a half macro and show you how I set up um, a dead bait. So then, we've got our half mackerel, nice fresh mackerel, and I always use fresh baits. Um, I never refreeze my baits. I'm always a great believer in using fresh mackerel. They're, they're only frozen down once. It's a nice fresh bait. And what I do before I set this, this mackerel up is that I'm going to cut through the tail because I want to make this bait as streamlined as possible. I want to cast the bait a long way, I don't want the bait spinning in the air and for long range fishing I want this bait to go out like a torpedo. So the way I do that is to chop the tail off. I'm not going to have this wobbling around in the air when the bait is cast so we can put that to one side. I'm going to slice down roughly halfway down the bait and what I like to do is that I like to trim the bait trim it at top and bottom and that just lets a little bit more juice and blood and oil out of the bait. It's a greater surface area when you chop it around and that also will fly through the air when I come to cast this bait much easier. So we'll put the head to one side for a moment and in front of me I've got an old spool of line. Now this is uh, this is 10 pound main line, 10 pound uh, line here. The main line I'm using is 15 pounds, so this is a weaker link. So I'm going to get a length of this, chop off a length of this line, and I'm going to form a loop or make a loop. Pull that down. It doesn't really matter whether this is a, a granny knot or a good knot as long as it's, it doesn't slip. So there's our, our loop of line and you can see that loop of line is smaller than the length of the trace. It's shorter than the length of the trace. I'm going to get the loop of line. This is the knot here and I'm going to put this loop through this section, pull it up tight up against the root of the tail and I'm going to, so that this doesn't slip, I'm going to do that again. So what you've got now is that the mackerel 
is now set up on a loop of line. I'm just going to put it through a further time for good measure. And this is going to take all the weight during the cast. Now then, what I like to do, especially in the winter, is that there are days where pike only feed once and you only get one chance at actually catching that fish. If a pike picks up your bait and you actually miss the fish and your bait comes off your hooks, the pike out in the middle of the gravel pit or in close will go off with that bait which is now lying on the bottom and it may not feed again for the rest of that day. Now that to me is a little bit unacceptable so I don't like losing my bait. Now you're going to say well how do you get your bait back if the hooks are only attached very loosely. Now the way I do this is that I've got my, my trace and you'll notice I'm going to put the trace through the loop. So if I strike and miss, this loop of line is going to be caught on the trebles and I'm going to be able to get my bait back. Right, so the loop of, I've taken the, the trace through the loop of line. This is the important part. The skin of the macro is actually tougher than the flesh and I'm just going to nick very loosely the point of this treble there into the bait. And there is the bait and the hooking position for this bait set up. Now if you try to cast that bait without this rig, the bait would go one way and your treble hooks and terminal tackle would go another way because the hooks are just not capable of supporting the bait. The loop of line now comes up and you can then the wire trace and is hooked onto the flat ridge and that ridge is flat, it's got to be flat because as soon as the terminal tackle and this link hits the water this loop of line is going to come off and the bait is going to be sat on the bottom. When a pike comes along and picks up this bait I can immediately strike and one of these treble hooks is going to be firmly positioned in the pike's mouth. Now there isn't going to be any problem with pulling these hooks out of the bait and I do want the hooks to come out of the bait. I don't like to see hooks left in a bait on the strike. The reason we use trebles is that it's a, they're, they're a great hooking mechanism. So we want, to, we want to get both of these trebles out of the bait and into the pike and get a firm hook hold. There are a couple of hundred teeth in a pike's mouth um, to say the very least and it's a very hard jaw and we need a firm hook hold first time. So the pike picks up the bait and I instantly pick up the rod and strike. What will now happen is that these hooks, because they're very loosely attached to the bait, will come out, rip, and they will both clear the bait. The pike is hooked, and even though the pike is hooked, I'm going to get this bait back because the bait is on the loop of line. It'll be dangling on the loop of line and that doesn't really worry me because both of the hooks are in the pike but I'm going to get my bait back because there may be another pike out there uh, which I want to catch afterwards and if I leave a free bait out there that pike may pick up the free bait and not my bait. So it's very important that you get your bait back. So you can see how that works. Let's go over to the gravel pit and I'll hook up this bait again and you can see exactly how the bait flies through the air, how it lands and you can see on the retrieve that the loop of line has come off the bait and I get my bait back. So I think we should do that now before, before moving any further. So we'll attach those hooks very loosely into the skin and we'll go over to the pit which is in front of me and 
we'll do a quick demonstration of how this rig works. So we're going to come over here and what I like to do uh, when I'm pike fishing, I know there's a feature out there anyway, um, but I like to pick a point on the far bank, there's also an island out there, and I want to be able to repeat the cast I've made. A lot of anglers cast the bait out, they catch a pike, and they've forgotten where they've actually cast their bait. So we're going to cast this bait, and I'm going to remember where this bait has actually been cast, so I can repeat the cast if necessary. So I'm going to get the bait, and we'll really give it some welly, and we'll, we'll get it out there. There's a gravel bar out there, and we've got to try to reach it. And you can see what I mean by the mackerel going out. It goes out dead straight, like a torpedo. Just take the bow out of that line and allow that bait just to sink slowly to the bottom. So the bait's now on the bottom. The loop of line is off the bait supporting link. The hooks are very lightly pinned into the bait. We've cast that bait maybe 60, 70 yards. And I know that if I get a run, I can pick up this rod immediately, strike, and I know that both hooks are going to come out of the bait and I'm going to get a firm hook hold on the pike. So let's put the rod in the rest and we'll tighten up to it. You'll notice that I've got the, the tip of the rod sunk so that I don't get any uh, leaves or rubbish on the surface giving me false alarms. Well, I'll reel the bait in just for our purposes and you'll notice that I'm going to get the bait back. So that if you do miss a fish, you're not leaving a freebie out there on the bottom. And you can see, although the hooks are only lightly pinned into the bait, the bait is trapped on the trebles and I get my bait back. Now it wouldn't matter whether those hooks are in a pike, I'd still get my bait back and I'd be able to use that bait again if necessary. Now there are some gravel pits which haven't got a great deal of weed on the bottom and you saw just then that I cast out and I could get a tight line right the way up to the bait. Now there are areas of this gravel pit which have got a clear gravel bottom and if I come to tighten up to the bait and I haven't got any weight on the trace, I find that I can't do it. So the little dodge I use is to bite a couple of swan shots on the trace and that adds a little bit of weight to my terminal tackle so I can get a tight line right up to the bait. It's important, and we've got to remember that uh, a pike might pick up the bait, it may sit on the bait, and it's really important that as soon as it picks up the bait, I get some type of indication because we don't want that fish swallowing the bait and damaging itself. So I'm going to move over here with exactly the same rig. It's a shorter rod. It's a three pound test curve rod, 11 foot. I like these rods. And we're going to cast over to this gravel bar and you'll see that I can tighten up to the bait because of the swan shot and I can get a nice tight line right the way back to the alarm. So we'll pick up this bait and we'll get it over there. It doesn't get tangled. Allow that bait to settle. And then you can see when I reel in, I'll pull that line and I've got a nice tight line all the way up to that mackerel. Set the rod in the alarm and submerge the rod tip. And you can see the line is really tight up to that bait. I don't like any slack line at all. So there it is. Now today, as far as bait is concerned, we're really sport for, for choice. We've got a rainbow trout here, a red snapper, sardines, sand eels.
the most deadly baits of all, in my opinion, a small pike, a small jack. And there are stages in the season where a small pike will outfish any other type of bait. So small pike, we mustn't forget, is an absolutely deadly bait. Now in contrast to gravel pits, my, some of my most favourite fishing and some of the most exciting fishing I've ever had is, is on the rivers. And people over the years have asked me what my favourite method is, and it's undoubtedly sink and draw. And for that, a rainbow trout, such as this little fellow here, or a brown trout, makes the ideal bait. They're very tough, they're very flexible, and they're very easily obtainable. I always like killing my bait um, when I get to the river bank. I don't like to take along um, frozen rainbow trout or brown trout um, because it takes all of the action out of the bait. They, uh, they turn very stiff and they break up very easily. So I kill me bait on the spot, it's nice and fresh and I can get plenty of action into that bait. Now the rig I use to mount this, uh, this little fellow on um, I've got here and I'm going to show you. Now it consists again of a 20 inch length of wire trace but attached to my top treble I've got my own design of dead bait wobble bar. Now the bar is pushed inside the fish and it's going to give weight to my fish. The fish can be allowed to touch bottom, I can draw the fish up uh, through to the middle depths of the water right up to the surface I can let that fish flutter back um, in a weir pool. Uh, I can let it bounce off bottom. I can do so many things with it. And all the time, I'm covering the length and breadth of the river. And when river fishing, location is absolutely paramount. It's the most in essential uh, part of river fishing. And with this method, I can cover vast areas of, of water. So let me show you how this is, this is mounted. Um, by the way, the, the dead bait wobble bar is attached to this, the, the eye uh, by some carbon Kevlar trace material. It can't be bitten through. I've also used wire and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what you use. I don't use nylon because uh, of course the pike can bite through that. So all as I do with a dead bait wobble bar is that the bar is placed inside the trout. I push it well back into the trout and it doesn't matter that the carbon Kevlar is sticking out because they're not going to bite through that anyway. And I'm going to go through the bottom lip, take the treble up through the top lip, and I'm going to pin this hook into the side of the body very loosely. This is going to take all the weight. It's a good firm hook hold there, and the weight is inside the bait. Now, you'll notice that there isn't any weight on the trace. Some anglers bite swan shots onto the trace or they'll use lead substitutes uh, on the trace and unfortunately that doesn't help you at all. The weight swings around in the water and it takes any of the action out of the bait. You want all of the action when you're reeling in to be transferred into this bait. You want the bait moving not the weight on the trace. That's very important. Now with this, with this bait, I can cover all depths of water. I can bounce it off the bottom. I can let it ride up in the current. I can wobble it up, up, up on the crease uh, where the weir comes down. Um, I can virtually do anything with this bait, covering all the depths imaginable. Now, you'll notice that inside that little trout, I've used a half ounce wobble bar and it's enough weight for me to sink that, uh, that bait um, and to cast that bait. It is only a small bait but for, for bigger baits or smaller baits we use different size wobble bars. For, for bigger trout, larger trout, I'm using an ounce, ounce and a quarter and that's there pushed inside the bait. For even bigger trout still we've got a, an ounce and three quarters, two ounces of weight there. Um, and uh, they're very effective. 
you can also, when you're boat fishing, um, troll using this method. You can put the rod in the, uh, the, uh, the rod rest uh, on the side of the boat. You don't need any float attached and you can troll using these wobble bars. And of course for sprats and, and very small baits we've got these little chaps here. I also use these in the summer when I want to twitch a bait across the surface, over the surface um, of the water and I don't want the bait to sink into the weed. So they also have their day and they're very important. Now earlier I showed you one hooking arrangement for uh, a wobble bait. This is, an this is an alternative. You've got three trebles attached to lengths of wire when I can sort them out. And you can see that there's a separate length of wire coming from the eye of this treble hook running down. You've got a treble attached there and you've got your third treble here. The leading treble is going to go through top and bottom lip and this treble here is going to go to the left hand side of the body, this to the right hand side of the body. And with this method you can strike virtually immediately because no matter how the pike grabs the bait you're going to get a, a reasonable hook hold. So let's, let's attach this bait and uh, I'll show you how it's done. So the leading treble through the top and bottom lip. Pin these two side trebles in very loosely. They're not taking the weight and you can see that the top and bottom lip is pinned together. There's a hook in the left hand side and a hook in the right hand side. Now you'll notice that there isn't any weight pushed inside the bait and this is because I want this bait to be fluttered in across the surface and it doesn't really matter whether it's a river or a gravel pit. I'll flutter that in across the surface and that in the summer when temperatures are very hot can be an absolutely deadly method. I can flutter this bait in on the surface of a gravel pit um, and it won't sink down that quickly. The swim bladder inside the bait is attached, I haven't punctured that and I can wobble that over the weed and again it's an absolutely killing method for summer fishing. And of course you've got a nice firm hook hold on top and bottom lip. So there it is. Now in contrast to sink and draw and dead baiting, laying a dead bait on the bottom. I also do an awful lot of float fishing when I'm fishing rivers and gravel pits and you can see here I've got a fluted float with concave surfaces. Now the concave surfaces are there for a reason and a lot of people don't really understand what a fluted float has got to offer. If you've got an upstream wind and you want to send a live or dead bait downstream, what happens is, is this. With a normal round bodied float, the water rushes around the float and with an upstream wind, that float won't move downstream or it won't move downstream fast enough to get our bait to wherever we want it to go. The concave sides or surfaces of this fluted float, one of the surfaces of that float, even though it turns in the current, will face the current, will get trapped in the concave surface and that float will be pushed downstream to where we want to send our bait. So the fluted float has got enormous advantages over the round bodied float when river fishing. Both floats have got their day but I love using these, these fluted floats. I've got many other floats too. I do a lot of night fishing on the rivers um, and I've got aluminous floats which I, I use at night but um, it's something worth thinking about. Now you can see attached to the main line I've got a large bead and a small bead. Now the in internal diameter um, of the small bead is very small. And that is because I don't want the bead 
to slide up over the stop knot because if it does that the float is going to slide up and the whole lot is going to be presented over depth. Um, so this is why I use two beads. Above the bead you can see dangling on the line is a piece of ordinary pole elastic. Now this pole elastic is normally used by match fishermen. It's medium gauge pole elastic and all as I've done with that pole elastic is basically tied a granny knot in it. And if I wanted to slide it up, I just wet the line and I can slide that stop knot up. The thing about pole elastic is that it doesn't damage your main line. It doesn't damage the uh, diameter of the main line locally and it can be reeled right onto the reel easily. It's soft and supple and it's very easy to tie. At the bottom of the float I've got a bead, a bead above the lead because I don't want the float damaged. You can see this is a very, it's a bit of an old float anyway. I've got my weight, another bead to keep the, uh, the weight away from the knot so that the knot is, isn't damaged and, and that's my float set up. So what I'll, I'll do is I'll show you how to make a trace and uh, this, is the way, this is the way I make my traces. I've got some extra strong treble hooks here. These are size 8 and let's, let's attach the top treble. Now what I've done is that I've taken the wire through the eye and back through the eye and I've brought the wire down into the central part of the hook. I'm going to wrap that wire around three times and I'm going to tuck the wire in through that little gap and pull it down firmly. And there is the first treble attached and that does not move. For the sec second treble I've got a crimping sleeve, slide the crimping sleeve up put place the crimping sleeve on the wire. I'm going to snip that end off and I've got about half an inch protruding from this end of the crimp. I'm going to bend that wire back over and it's going to go through the eye of this crimping sleeve a third time. My eyes are not what they were but we can just about manage that. It goes back through the crimping sleeve there and I'm going to slide the crimping sleeve down and that's the gap, the type of gap I leave when I'm using a half mackerel bait. Now all we need to do now is get a pair of pliers or a crimping tool. I'm just using pliers. I'm crimping once, two, three times and it's a nice neat attachment. To this end, I'll snip a bit off the wire, get it nice and straight and smooth. I've got a crimping sleeve which I'm going to slide down the trace. This trace is 28 pound by the way. I don't use 20 pound wire. Wire is inherently unreliable stuff and I've found with 20 pound wire you get a slight kink in it and it breaks. I've got a lot more faith in 28 pound wire and I'm going to do the same or try to do the same here through there once I'm going to put a little bend in it and I'm going to slip the wire 
third time into the crimping sleeve and pull it up on itself and I'm going to crimp up and that hasn't taken many minutes and you're left with a first rate trace and what could be simpler than that so for river fishing I've mentioned sink and draw and for me there's only one reel to use uh, and that's the multiplier this is an Abu 6000 6001 and it's a comfortable reel to use and we mustn't forget that when I go out fishing sometimes I'm in the boat or I'm on the bank and uh, I might, this rod might be in my hand for 12 or even 14 hours a day. So the reel's got to be light, it's got to be much lighter than a fixed spool reel. You've got much more control with a multiplier. You can feel every little knock and twitch through the line and they really are the tool for the job. And you can see you've got incredible control with a multiplier and they really are a joy to use. So this is, this is the tool I'd use every time. Just to round off this section, let's have a look at some of the tackle and equipment available to the modern day pine. In front of us, we have lure boxes, a compass, deep and shallow diving plugs, lead core line for trolling, crimping sleeves, a depth o plug for finding depths, wobble bars, partridge extra strong trebles, and a selection of floats. Also, way slings, keep sacks, and a bow framed landing net, along with a selection of rods of varying test curves, plus reels and rests. The list is endless, really but all of these items are useful as part of our arsenal to tackle one of our favourite predators. Well, we've come to the end of this programme on tackle and techniques. I hope you have found some of the methods of interest and are able to use some of the tips I have mentioned. Don't forget to look out for my other video, which deals with catching pike from rivers and gravel pits. So, from me, it's bye for now tight lines and good fishing.